Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning back in once again to the original Queen Amadai Shakur show. I'm your host, Queen Amadai Shakur, and this is your daily vitamins. So as you're coming in, please feel free to go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Be sure to click that notification bell and click the word all so that you're notified each time the Queen Goddess goes live. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Queen Amadai Shakur. You can also follow the Queen Amadai Shakur fan page on Instagram and Twitter, and you can follow me on Twitter at dgoddess 27 Make sure you hustle on over uh, to my website, queenamadajakur.com, and subscribe so that you're added to my email list, okay, so I can send you uh, notifications. Also, uh, make sure you like and share this video. It's very important that this video is liked and shared, okay? So with that all being said, let's get into it. Um, for those of you who missed the interview that I did yesterday with Mr. Thomas Hargrove, you might want to go out, go and check that out when you get some time, okay? Because that pertains to this. Uh, Queen's black on the scene. Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, so let's get into it. So I'm going to be talking about um, the 51 black women who came up murdered in Chicago, strangled, all of them strangled. And uh, the cases are unsolved, right? Most of the cases are unsolved. Uh, this has been going on for a period of years. Um, there is a there is a person. I'm not going to say he's a suspect, but there is a person who confessed to being a serial killer, and he's currently in prison uh, with a life sentence. But he also admitted that he killed people in Illinois and a lot of people. He didn't say how many. Uh, so he killed women there. Uh, so I'm going to be showing his confession video, which we were able to get through the Freedom of Information Act, okay? Uh, so with that all being said, let's get into it. And I'm going to start, first of all, with um, how I came upon this story. Hey, CH464, um, Silent D is in the house. Byron B, I see you, beloved. Okay, looks like this chat is froze. Mr. Hotel said the queen has arrived, y'all. <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to have to use my phone because this chat is freezing. Uh, the queen has arrived, y'all. So rise and bow, looking ever so lovely per usual. We see you, queen. <laughs> thank you, beloved. Uh, thank you. All right. And so with that all being said, let me pull the chat up on my phone also in case it gets uh, stuck again. All right. So let's get ready to get into it. So as I was saying, I came upon this story back in May when I actually did a story about a, a black woman who was found chained up in an abandoned house, y'all remember that. I'm gonna show um, a couple of clips from that because the woman who was actually uh, saved from that, she actually did an interview. They don't show her face, but she tells her story. So I'm gonna start off with that because that's what led me into this whole thing because I had not heard about this in the news. Okay, so let's get into it. Everyone, please like and share, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you in advance. Now, I'm about to share my screen to show you the reports on the woman that uh, was found chained up in the abandoned house back in May of 2022. And uh, like I said, I reported on this months ago. Okay, so here it is. Likes up, everyone. The option of having a video visit with my primary care physician is phenomenal. It adds an extra layer of assurance because they care about your safety. It offers you an opportunity to see your doctor, to ask them very specific questions. I feel that much more safe. You can't put a price tag on having faith and confidence in your healthcare provider. That's what Kaiser Permanente offers to me. <laughs> You know, in late May, we told you about a woman who was chained up inside an abandoned building by a man who sexually assaulted her near 119th and Eggleston. Her only saving grace was the passerby who heard her cries for help. She told police that he was an acquaintance who sparked up a conversation before turning on her. She's been being on the window for weeks. We talked to the girl and everything. Man on everything, G. She in there. How she can't get out? She tied up. She tied up or something. Locked in that room. Or locked in that room. 44-year-old Joel Kamen here was charged with aggravated criminal sexual assault and aggravated kidnapping in that case. 
You know, it happens more often than you think, and she's one of the lucky ones. Killers know that these abandoned homes, they make the perfect place to permanently silence their prey. They know no one steps foot inside these buildings for weeks, months, even years. And by then, critical evidence is often overlooked or destroyed. In fact, this is a 27-year pattern that's been repeated over and over and over again. The Murder Accountability Project in Alexandria, Virginia, has been tracking these violent crimes. You can see the dots on this map. They show where dozens of women, mostly black women, were beaten and strangled to death. Some of them were left in those abandoned buildings, others in dumpsters, others dismembered. And we talked with one of those families about the anguish and the never-ending questions of who did it and why. Myrna Walker will never forget the sinking feeling in her gut when she realized the moment her sister Nancy went missing nearly 20 years ago from this very building that still bears a plaque with her name in Bronzeville. Nancy was the eldest of six siblings and as a result would become a leader in life and in business. Nancy was an entrepreneur. She had many businesses. She was a dancer. She owned a beauty salon houses, condos, townhouses, uh, two flats, three flats, you name it, she had it. Nancy, her family says, was a perfectionist, a detail-oriented person who didn't trust strangers. But on that fateful day in January of 2003, Nancy got into a van with two men Myrna did not know. A black van pulled up. And they say she came out of the salon, walked over to the van, opened the door, got in, and they just took off with her. And they were probably telling her about some property that they may have wanted to show her. But I don't think she totally trusted them, but she didn't tell me about them because maybe they were kind of, um, not really, yeah, kind of shady. And so as soon as I got back to my office, I called her and I'm like, I waited for you and you didn't show up and you haven't called me. I said, call me. And she never called me. So when I got home, I called her again and I bawled her out again. She didn't call me again. So I'm like, okay. I'll call her the night before we go to bed. Cause we usually talk every night before we go to bed. She didn't answer. Myrna went to her sister's condo and everything inside was in perfect order. Oddly, her cell phone was still there. Nancy was not. So I said, this is not good. So that's when we left her place and we went straight to the precinct to put in a missing persons report. This is where critical time is wasted. Myrna says once Chicago police found out Nancy was from Inglewood, the urgency was tempered with questions about her character. They stereotype people from Inglewood. Everybody's a criminal. Everybody took guns. Made us feel like we weren't worthy. It wasn't until Myrna got support from well-known Chicagoans Delmarie Cobb, Alderman Dorothy Tillman, and then Commissioner Tony Preckwinkle that police started to finally listen. And then, 63 days after she went missing, workers found three bags along the Bishop Ford Expressway. Three bags, head in one, arms in another, and legs in the other. They never found the torso. We don't know what they did with the torso. She was first strangled. There was an indication that she was beaten. What could a person do so bad to you or say so terrible to you that you could do something like that to them? It is hard for Myrna to share details of her sister's disappearance and murder. The pain is as fresh today as it was then. And the questions of who and why remain. Now, we did reach out to the Chicago Police Department to get a status update from them on the Nancy Walker case and on the information collected by the Murder Accountability Project. And here's what they tell us. They say, quote, each of these cases has been reviewed by detectives who are detailed to the FBI's Violent Crimes Task Force, and there is no evidence linking the cases to each other or suggest that there is a serial killer responsible for these homicides. Detectives are continuing to investigate the cases individually as we work to seek justice on behalf of the victims 
and their families. Of course, Fox 32 is going to be looking deeper into the dozens, dozens of the unsolved strangulation murders of black women. And in the coming weeks, I'm going to be talking to more families left with no answers and no justice. From the Murder Accountability Project tracking these cases to the longtime Chicago homicide detectives and the tireless community activists who believe this is the work of one or more serial killers. And we're going to tell you their theories and concerns about all of the silenced prey cases that remain unsolved. Can't imagine the frustration. You can hear the anguish and the frustration in that uh, in her voice. You and I were talking in the newsroom and you were telling me that not only is strangulation one of the more violent forms of taking a life, but it takes tremendous strength, does it not? Yeah, and they only account, they're only 1% of the murders that we have in Chicago, according to the homicide detectives that I've spoke with. And that's why they feel that they should look deeper into this. And you're right, it takes a great amount of strength to strangle someone. This person is fighting for their life. And it's not over like the movies in 30 seconds or 40 seconds. It takes several minutes, sometimes up to 10 minutes to strangle someone. And the fact that the individuals are often tied with ropes or duct tape shows that whoever was doing this was on the hunt for somebody to do. Who carries around duct tape and rope in their car? And does it mean it's a serial killer, one individual? That's what we need to find out. And that's what some believe. And of course, the Chicago police are telling us otherwise. But uh, there are people who believe the opposite. She says there are people who believe the opposite because the police aren't so sure that it's a serial killer. Now, when I spoke with Mr. Hargrove on yesterday during the interview, he did say that a friend of his from the police department did say uh, that it's likely a serial killer or serial killers, maybe more than one. Uh, with that all being said, they don't have any proof of that thus far. And so they're not saying that it's a serial killer. And some of them likely don't think it's a serial killer, but uh, other people have different opinions. Uh, so the Murder Accountability Project, which Thomas Hargrove is the director of, they absolutely think it's the work of serial killers. And I think so too. Okay, so now I'm gonna go to the video footage of the woman who was actually the, uh, the person that was chained up in that house. Okay, uh, so, and she's gonna tell her story um likes up everyone please a like and share okay here we go cooking demos to help you create Chicago police are investigating after a woman says she was abducted raped and chained up inside a vacant Southside house for days Good evening, everyone. I'm Jackie Bang. And I'm Tamon Bradley. Thanks for joining us. WGN's Jewel Hillary is live at Area 2 Police Headquarters on the far south side with the story. Jewel. Hi, good evening, Jackie and Tamon. Well, a 36-year-old woman tells us that she was held captive inside of an abandoned West Pullman home for four to five days. She was finally freed on Saturday evening after a local community activist heard her cries for help and called police. Just him hearing my cry, my, my, my call, because I've been doing that for days. This 36-year-old woman, who we are keeping anonymous, says she was walking to a neighborhood store early last week when she ran into a man who she's talked to before. And I ended up bumping to see him, and he was like, you know, come here for a minute. That's when the woman says the unthinkable happened. He just grabbed me, and, and I'm trying to fight him, but can't, can't fight him. From there, the woman says the man took her into this abandoned house in the 119th block of South Eggleston. He raped me twice. Then he sat up there. He left me up in there handcuffed and chained. The woman says the man, who she thinks is in his 60s, took her to the basement and then dragged her to the attic. Ankle chained up, handcuffed, just, just, just in there, just bounded. Days after crying out for help on Saturday night around 5:30, as I got closer, I'm hearing boom, 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 help, and that's what made me call the police. Once he heard the cries for help, hands around the hundreds, community activist Antoine Dobine, also known as D Ice, went live on Facebook. I just located a girl inside this house. The police say she chained up. Before police arrived on the scene, Antoine says he saw a man come from the vacant house. He's got on a blue jean corduroy jacket. I don't know what type of pants. I'm going to say he's about, about five foot eight, five seven. 
After police rescued the woman from the house, she went to a local hospital to be checked out. She says she is filled with gratitude to Antoine for stepping in. He could not ignore me, but he heard me and he helped me. I'm just blessed. I'm truly blessed. In the aftermath of what's happened, people who grew up in this neighborhood question what could be inside the other abandoned properties nearby and hope good can come from this tragic incident. Let's open an abandoned homes. Let's walk through the homes. Let's do a search. Let's lock it back up. Just make sure it make sure everything is OK. Antoine is asking for money to help turn the deserted properties into resources for the community. Returning citizens from uh, incarceration need a place to stay. Our mental health people need a place to stay to get back on their feet. As for the woman rescued from the house, she says she is grateful to be alive and doesn't want what's happened to her to happen to anyone else. I believe that he will strike again. So, I mean, I, I want him caught. At last check with police, no offenders were in custody. Reporting live outside of the area to police center on the far south side. I'm Okay, so that all being said, uh, the man was caught. That was him on the first video that actually caught him. Okay, and that's the alleged assailant. Uh, so now with that all being said, I'm going to go to a PowerPoint presentation that I have and um, give you some insight onto the case, and then we'll move forward. All right, Byron says, salute to Brother Antoine. Absolutely. Okay, healing vibrations to the sisters who make it out, says Kenyatta. Absolutely. Thank you, beloved. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so we can view this PowerPoint. It is crazy and sick, Mr. Hotel. Absolutely, beloved. Likes up, everyone, please like and share. Like and share. Okay. The Chicago strangulations of over 50 black women. Let's get into it. So between 1999 and 2018, there were dozens of chillingly similar cases of women killed by strangulation in Chicago's South and West Sides, and they're all still unsolved. These are some of the pictures of the victims. Now, since 1999, at least 50 women, mostly Black, have been murdered in disturbingly similar fashion. Uh, but it is, is it the work of a single serial killer dubbed the Chicago Strangler? Well, that's what some people seem to think. Now, some people think that it's actually more than one serial killer, which I think that it is. I think there's maybe two at least. Uh, Thomas Hargrove thinks that there's possibly three. Okay, he said he thinks that maybe one of them is white and then two black ones. And so we'll get later into the discussion and you'll see why. Also, if you saw the video yesterday, the interview that I did with him, then you likely know the answer to that. Now, opinions differ. The Chicago police deny that any one person is behind the slayings. Okay, others point to parallels across the murders, including location, method, and victimology uh, to suggest a Chicago serial killer has been terrorizing the streets for over two decades. Now, between 1999 and 2018, 75 women between the ages of 18 and 58 were strangled to death in Chicago. By the end of 2019, the police had only solved 24 cases, and the remaining 51 are more alike than they are different. And so all the women were found dumped after being killed in Chicago's south and west side neighborhoods, usually in abandoned buildings or alleyways. About 47% had a history of sex work and about three quarters were black. They were also killed in a brutal fashion. Some victims were raped and beaten. Others were bound and gagged. Some of the women had plastic bags tied over their heads. Most were stripped of their clothing. Some were set afire. And now most of these deaths represents a unique tragedy to the families they leave behind. Angela Ford, the earliest unsolved case vanished after leaving home to uh, pick up her children's report cards in 1999. She was found strangled and unconscious days after her disappearance, and she eventually died in 2001, a year and a half after uh, she had been in a coma. So that's all very sad. Now, they strangled her almost to death as she was in a coma for a year and a half. Now, Gwendolyn Williams 
in 2002. Okay, the eldest of six, she was found murdered. Uh, when you have a family, this is what her relatives say. Um, when you have a family that's so close and so used to doing every single thing together, everything together, you don't imagine anybody in that puzzle missing. That's what her brother, Michael Prechette, said. Not one piece missing. And they took her, they took her from us. You know, you done messed up our puzzle. Uh, this is what her brother had to say. Now, then there was two women killed on the same day in 2007, Teresa Bunn and Hazel Lewis. In 2007, two women were found murdered within 48 hours of each other. My mistake, not the same day, but within 48 hours of one another. Teresa Bunn was eight months pregnant. She was strangled, stripped, thrown into a dumpster and set a fire. Now, the next day, Hazel Lewis's body was found in a burning trash can behind the elementary school. So again, you see the similarities in the crimes. Both of them were just dumped as if they were trash and then set ablaze. And that was likely to destroy DNA evidence. No media attention. So yet, despite the violence and frequency of these murders, few have elicited much media attention. Now, you're talking about women who were thrown in the trash who were found in abandoned buildings. Uh, this is what Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox said. Horrors that were just blips in the news, if at all. In recent years, however, this spate, this spate of deaths has gotten a closer look. And some believe that a single serial killer of the so-called Chicago Strangler could be behind the murders. Now, Thomas Hargrave, Hargrove, founder of the Murder Accountability Project, also known as MAP, uh, the murders in Chicago are more than random violence, is what he thinks. Uh, he believes it's the work of possibly more than one serial killer. Hargrove founded MAP in 2015 after studying the serial killer Gary Ridgway. Now, Ridgway killed dozens, as many as 70 people. And remember, Gary Ridgway is known as the Green River Killer. If you all never heard of him, he was killing women that were mostly uh, prostitutes. Okay, so uh, he killed as many as 70 people before his arrest in 2001. But it took police a long time to realize that they were dealing with one killer. Hargrove believes that a well-tuned algorithm uh, could have found patterns that police missed, which would have shown, you know, clusters of areas where the bodies were all found, you know, uh, crime scenes in close proximity and things of that nature. So similar MO, which is modus operandi, which means, you know, the tactics used, right? Basically, Hargrove says, first of all, um, almost all of the victims were recovered out of doors, even in alleyways or abandoned, often in alleyways or abandoned properties. Uh, that's pretty unusual, he says. Now, at least three quarters of the victims, uh, their deaths had a clear sexual component. The victims were found partially disrobed, completely nude, or parts of their clothing were ripped to expose their female form. Uh, these 51 women were not killed by 51 separate men. Many of these women, probably most of these, were killed by men who have killed before. Now, Chicago, a Chicago police spokesperson echoed that statement saying, there is absolutely no information to suggest this is the work of an active serial killer. To conclude otherwise without detailed case information known by detectives would be hyperbolic and uh, careless. Well, here's the thing. At the end of the day, um, you know, oftentimes it takes someone who studies serial killings uh, and who studies, you know, patterns of murders and things like that uh, to realize that it's in fact a serial killer or possibly a serial killer. Now, some of the police possibly think that it's a serial killer. Uh, some of them do not. But the thing is, they don't have any solid evidence to link the murders together to conclude that it's actually the work of a serial killer or multiple serial killers. All right. So they have to go by the evidence. Uh, so with that all being said, Darren Dion Vaughn, it's spelled Van, but it's pronounced Vaughn. Now, the Chicago stranger could certainly be a serial killer, according to Hargrove. He's even suggested this person as one of the, you know, possibly 
one of the perpetuators of these crimes. Vaughn strangled multiple women in Gary, Indiana, and then dumped their bodies in abandoned buildings before his arrest in 2014. Now, he even told police that he killed people in Illinois. However, at this time, there's no connection between him and the 51 murders in Chicago. Hargrove also noted that anyone arrested for any of the 51 murders should be considered a suspect. He said any arrest that they make among 50, these 51 strangulations should be, and I'm sure will be, aggressively reviewed for the possibility that they are in fact linked to other killings. Uh, but it's also possible that Chicago has something much worse than a serial killer. Now, it's also possible that the city has merely let the murders of 50 women go unsolved for more than two decades. And these, again, are pictures of the victims. So now this last statement about Chicago possibly, you know, having just let women be killed for over the decades, that could be the case. Maybe they just didn't do enough, you know, uh, investigative work. I don't know. But it's likely, like Hargrove says, a work of one or more serial killers. Now, John Fontaine, a journalism professor at Roosevelt University, assigned his students to tell the women's stories in 2020. He said, I am convinced that if there were 51 dogs killed in the city of Chicago, people would be in people would be up in arms. Uh, but we weren't. Now, sadly, I think he's absolutely right, because I'm going to tell you something. If someone was out here killing dogs or whatever, it'd be all over the lamestream media. And we all know that. OK, but because most of these women who were killed were black, there's little to no fanfare. All right. And that's just what it is. Uh, so. All right. Absolutely. OK, absolutely. OK, so now with that all being said. Let's go to some more footage. Likes up, everyone. Please remember to like and share. Very important uh, that you like and share uh, the video. Okay, so let's talk about the algorithm that Thomas Hargrove was talking about yesterday um, during the interview. And as I just mentioned, so I'm going to pull share my screen, pull up this video. Police solve crimes with the help of communities. Yes, absolutely. That's the thing. Sometimes people have to come forward. But sadly, some people call that snitching when you're actually a concerned citizen and they don't want to say anything. Uh, Byron says, agreed. That that and taking out our queens is a good way for them to lower our birth rates. Uh, yeah, that's all true. But this is actually a serial killer or more than one, I do believe. Um, hold on. Queen, that was a good interview that you did the other day. I watched it on the replay last night. Thank you, beloved. I just found out about this company called Homeroom, who can get you up to 50%. Whenever I see data, I tend to think in terms of patterns. The real world is following rather simple mathematical formula. And it's that way with murder. Most people don't realize that we're far less likely to solve a murder today than we were 50 years ago. My name is Thomas Hargrove, and I am the founder and chairman of the Murder Accountability Project. I'm not a police officer. Quite frankly, I am just a nerd. I really know very little about serial killers. I do know what they look like in data. For 37 years, I was a newspaper reporter, and it was just the best job there is in the universe. Increasingly, I became known as the numbers guy in the newsroom. We wanted to study why murders go unsolved and why a growing number of murders go unsolved. And the first time I saw the supplementary homicide report by the FBI, my first thought was, I wonder if we could teach a computer to spot serial killers in these data. And the answer is yes. Years before, I had learned of a phenomenon called linkage blindness. The only way the murders are linked to a common offender is if the two investigators get together by the water cooler and talk about their cases and discover commonalities. 
We contacted the FBI and got every year's worth of reporting back to 1980. I opened it up and looked at row after row of individual murders. It had the victim's age, race, sex, how the victim was killed. We turned that into a nine-digit number, essentially a Dewey Decimal System of Death. During the months that I was working on the algorithm, I had over my desk a picture of Green River killer Gary Ridgway. He killed 48 women in Seattle in the 80s and 90s. He was looking at me for months and months while I was trying to make an algorithm work. The only way we would know that an algorithm was successful is if it was identifying known serial killers. What worked was a technique called cluster analysis. And we told the computer to cluster the data. Seattle came up clear as day, something awful had happened, and the algorithm was producing dozens and dozens of other clusters that looked just as bad as Seattle that were not known. Like Gary, Indiana, there were actually 15 unsolved strangulations of women in the area, including 13 in Gary itself. I contacted the Gary Police Department and gave them my usual spiel. I'm Tom Hargrove. We have a method to identify serial killers. There have been too many unsolved strangulations. What do you know about it? Absolute radio silence. They would not talk about the possibility there was a serial killer active. In 2014, just next door to Gary, Hammond police were summoned to a Motel 6 dead woman in the bathtub. They make an arrest very quickly. Darren Van started confessing that he had been at this for decades, going back to the 90s. In all, seven women died after we had tried repeatedly for months to get them to consider the possibility that they had a serial killer. This was without question, the most frustrating experience in my professional life. I have absolutely no doubt that many of the unsolved strangulation murders of women in Gary, Indiana are Mr. Van's handiwork. We have more than 220,000 unsolved murders in the United States. We've gathered records on more than 23,000 murders that were never reported to the Justice Department. And we are continuing. We can see where unreported murders are, and we go to police departments and say, you must start reporting data. I'm going to do what it takes to start solving murder. That's our dream, and that's why we try to make homicide data as available as possible. There is an algorithm that can identify serial killings and does. What's more serious than murder? What's more serious than serial murder? What's better than having a computer be able to identify things that human beings are missing? Catching killers saves lives, and so whatever we can do would be doing the Lord's work. All right. Uh, so how could how could you live knowing uh, you murdered a soul? Well, beloved, see, Stan, honey, some people don't care about that. Some people are psychopaths and sociopaths, and they are born. Psychopaths are born without the ability. They have no conscience. So they have the inability uh, to feel empathy and sympathy, except for themselves. They don't feel remorse and things like that. They don't feel guilt, only for themselves. Sociopaths are the same. The only difference is they were not born that way. They became that way over a period of time through things that happened within their lives, okay? Through society. That's why it's called sociopaths. All right, so that's why they can do it, okay? That's why they can do it. Uh, Mr. Hotel said that video was great. Thanks for sharing, Queen. You're welcome, beloved, but there's more to come. Okay, so now let's get into it because that was just to give you all an idea of the work that Thomas Hargrove and the Murder Accountability Project has put into this, okay? He's been following this case for years and also gathering evidence and research and giving this information to the Chicago police, all right? And something that me and him have in common is the fact that he 
looks for information to help or research to help catch serial killers, uh, to help find the murderers of these women, right? And I am a serial killer expert, okay? Uh, so with that all being said, I have an interest in true crimes and specifically serial killers. As you all should know, those of you who follow my true crime channel. Okay, so now I'm going to pull up. Um, this is basically a promo because they actually did a, a story about this. So I'm going to pull up the promo for that for you all to see it. Everyone, please like and share. Like and share. And we'll hear some, from some of the families of the uh, more families of the victims. So I just stopped moving and acted like I wasn't breathing. He was trying to strangle me to kill me. So I just stopped moving and acted like I wasn't breathing. When I first heard about it, it almost sounded like an urban legend. There's no way multiple black girls have been killed in similar ways and no one's looking for them. Strangulation, asphyxiation, every single one of them done the same way. These are not random acts of street violence. Okay, so is there any marks or anything on her? No, there's something wrapped around her neck. There's something wrapped around her neck. It screams serial killer. Is it possible that one person is responsible for more than one of the cases? Of course it is. We just don't have the evidence to support that yet. In my opinion, when you get to the black and brown communities, they get policed differently. You're talking about women who were thrown in the trash, who were found in abandoned buildings, like horrors. We continue to worry that 51 is not the right number. We know damn well it's more women than that. And then you say, well, we don't know why these things are happening here. Yes, you do, because you've essentially created the perfect place to get away with murder. Okay, so let me say this uh, exactly real. This sounds like a group of murders. Let me say this. Uh, Mr. Hotel said, I think the number is higher. Well, the number is likely higher. One thing about serial killers when they're operating and they get caught like Vaughn got caught and I'm going to play his uh, recorded confession, okay? And here's the thing. I want you all to pay attention because I'm reading some of the comments. Um, the thing is this. This likely has nothing to do with hate. This has to do with serial killers, okay? Um, at the end of the day, serial killers usually kill the same gender of people, okay? Like Jeffrey Dahmer was killing men. Now, or Ted Bundy was killing only women, okay? John Wayne Gacy was killing men and young teenage boys. Uh, so they usually kill the same gender, and they also usually kill the same race. Now, sometimes there's exceptions to the rule in everything. For example, Jeffrey Dahmer was killing black men, right? Uh, but usually, in most cases, if you know anything about serial killers, most serial killers kill people who look like them. And that's just a fact. So if there is a serial killer killing a bunch of black women, usually it's a black man. Uh, like with the case of Vaughn, who's videotaped confession I'm going to show. I believe that he killed many of these women. He said himself, as you will hear, that he killed many women in Illinois where these women were found. Now, he's not going to take them to the sites. He's not going to give them all the specific details like he did in Indiana because he all of a sudden doesn't want the death penalty. But in the beginning, he was asking for it. But now he's decided that he wants to live. So what he's not going to do is give up all the information on his other crimes because, you see, then other states could come after him because he was killing in multiple states, okay? And at the end of the day, that could lead him to the death penalty. Right now he has life in prison, and that's where he's trying to keep it, all right? Uh, so now with that all being said, let's continue. Likes up, everyone. Please make sure that you like, 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 and share. Okay, so uh, let's talk about 
the professor who had his students uh, do reports on this in 2020. And that is uh, Professor John Fontaine. Shout out to Thomas Hargrove, the Murder Accountability Project, and Professor John Fontaine, because they keep these stories in the public eye, uh, putting in their work. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Likes up, everyone. Please like and share. In the past 20 years, more than 50 women have been brutally murdered in Chicago. Their bodies left in alleys, vacant lots, and abandoned houses, leaving one research group that tracks unsolved murders to suggest a serial killer may be at work. So who are these women? Well, up until now, their stories have largely been untold. But as WGN's Tanya Francisco reports tonight, a group of journalism students and their professor are working to change that. I made a decision that I wanted to, you know, make all the pictures black and white. I wanted folks to see who these women were. But as you look at them, their names and faces are probably not familiar, even though their deaths were shockingly vicious and violent. We've got to shine a light on this. John Fountain is a journalism professor at Roosevelt University. He's also a former New York Times national correspondent and a former chief crime reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Last January, Fountain assigned his students an ambitious project to tell the untold stories of 51 murdered women, all of whom were strangled or asphyxiated, some even dismembered and burned. Their bodies discarded like trash in alleys, vacant lots, and abandoned houses scattered across Chicago. Most of their deaths remain unsolved and unreported on by mainstream media. That was an emotional experience. Samantha Latson is one of 16 student journalists who worked for a year tracking down the families of the victims and getting them to open up about their loved ones. They were thankful that I even cared. It didn't matter that I was a student at Roosevelt. It gives me hope that something would come out of the, um, the articles. Myrna Walker lost her older sister Nancy 18 years ago in the most violent way possible. She disappeared January 28, 2003, hours before she was to meet Myrna for lunch. But it wasn't until a couple of days later the family realized something was horribly wrong. She never missed dance, ever, 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 ever. When Nancy didn't show up to teach her dance class at her Buddhist temple, her family reported her missing to Chicago police. From go, they treated us like we were nobody. Nearly two months later, Nancy's body was found on the side of the road by a cleaning crew. She had been dismembered and put into three black contractor bags. The medical examiner says she had been strangled. I just want to know why. If you could just tell me why. The Murder Accountability Project, which first raised the red flag about the deaths of these 51 women, says the pattern suggests a serial killer at work and that many of the women were prostitutes or drug addicts. Even if they were, number one, that's not true. But even if they were, they are human beings and they have a story to tell. Nancy was a daughter. She was a sister. She was a businesswoman. She loved life. And Nancy Walker was caring. One month before she disappeared, she worried about another young woman who was missing in California, Lacey Peterson. Every day when my sister and I would get together, she said, Marna, did they find that Lacey lady yet? And I was like, no, they didn't find her yet. Little did we know, you know, that we would be asking the same question about her. But unlike Lacey Peterson, Nancy Walker's disappearance got precious little local media attention, much less the national headlines Peterson was getting. Why? Many have openly argued it's because the 51 murdered women, including Nancy Walker, are mostly black. We're the uh, America's most unwanted. No one really wants to hear our stories. Why do you think that is? One, because we're black, and two, because we're women. We understand how people feel, and we want them to know that the detectives are out there and they're doing the best of which they're capable to solve these crimes. And we're looking to do a better job of connecting with the community as well. Brendan Dinahan is the chief of detectives for Chicago police. 
July 2019, CPD created a task force made up of FBI and CPD detectives to review the cases of the 51 murdered women. We didn't find any connections specifically stating, you know, through DNA or any other connection through investigatory leads stating that all these cases were linked. They were, however, able to solve four cases, but the state's attorney's office felt charges could only be sustained in one, that of Diamond Turner. The man charged with her murder is also a suspect in two other homicides. Well, there's always hope. They're murder investigations, so they're never closed. Professor Fountain doesn't want this to be a story about race, but he says it's hard to ignore the obvious. And I am convinced that if there were 51 dogs that were killed in the city of Chicago, the city would be up in arms. And we aren't with these women who have been killed. And we have to change that in society to understand that every life matters. As for Nancy Walker's case, it remains an open investigation. 18 years later, there have been no arrests or new leads. You can check out the website unforgotten51.com to read more about. Okay, so, oh, I'm sorry. There was another video that I wanted to show you. I'll hold on on that same site. Let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Okay. Likes up, everyone. Please like and share. Um, Jeff, I don't know if it's on Netflix, beloved. Try to Google it. I'm not sure where it is. I have not seen it. I would like to watch it, um, but I'm not sure. I'll have to look later on. Make sure you all can see that. Okay. And then we can begin to approach it in a way. This is an epidemic. You know, if, if, if it had been a different demographic, it would be an epidemic. But because they're poor and addicted, and even the way that he leaves them left like litter, takes them down in the way that people become desensitized to life, you know, by these tags that we uh, give them. So I, I mean, I'm just, I'm like 50 women gone. I'm not gonna keep changing the number because we already know, you know? But they may be gone in body, you know what I mean? But we still have an obligation to honor their lives. You know, that as a society, that's what should be important. And, and so then, but when it gets, someone does breaking news and these women, and is it a serial? So people would call me like, um, so we heard there's a serial killer. And so when I'm talking, I'm saying, um, I, I'm not that interested in the serial killer component mm -hmm. of this. And don't think that sexy, cause it's not. And don't try to lead with the serial killer Let's take them and deal with the women. You know what I mean? We can use that it could be a serial killer because sometimes, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, whatever. And if it bleeds in a serial killer, then it all is really, you know. So, but that's not um, what matters. I feel like their lives can still add value because they can teach us how, you know, to interact in a different way with those who are less fortunate. Okay, I clearly could have done without that music. That music had nothing to do with it. Okay, that music had nothing to do with it. Now, here's the thing. She said, let's not lead with the... Um, Mojo says, boo hoo hoo. Is that a troll? Is Mojo a troll? I'm inclined to think so. Mojo, watch yourself. Uh, but so here's the thing. Um, hold on. My chat's getting stuck. Let me read some of these comments real quick before I move forward. 
Everyone, please like and share. Uh, they said Mojo's a troll. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hold on, beloveds. Hold on, I'm trying to find the trolls so I can block them. Okay, okay, they are they've already taken care of it. Okay, great. Okay, so uh thank you, mods, for taking care of that. <laughs> Absolutely, Mr. Hotel, right? Uh, so anyway, here's the thing, beloveds. Um, if you are as upset as the others uh, that don't value us, they don't. They don't know we have to care. All right. Yeah, that was a troll, clearly. Okay, so here's the thing. Pay attention, beloveds. Now she said, "Let's not lead with the serial killer thing." Well. That's obviously the ramblings of someone who doesn't know anything about serial killers, okay? Here's the thing. Do you all actually think, and I want you to use common sense, do you all think that 51 separate killers would all be killing people in the exact same way? All of these women were strangled. They were left outside, uh, thrown in dumpsters and trash cans. In some cases, the body set ablaze. These all had the same M.O. The killers use the same MO. So it's very unlikely, okay, that this will be 50 plus different killers killing each of these women individually. Like I read to you earlier on the PowerPoint, Gary Ridgeway, known as the Green River Killer, he killed at least 70 people. Uh, BTK, buying, kill, torture, Dennis Rader, he killed at least 30 people. Ted Bundy, at least 30. Samuel Little boasts that he killed at least 80. Serial killers and Samuel Little, just so you know, the people that he killed, the women that he killed were black, okay? That's just what it was, all right? So Coleman and Deborah Brown, the people that they killed were black. Serial killers usually kill people who look like them. Now I'm about to play the video of the confession of whom I think is responsible for many of these murders. Well, you know what? Actually, before I play that video confession, um, before I play that, I'm going to show the arrest of Hillard. Now, Hillard was arrested for one of the women's murders. They showed a clip of him in another video. So I'm going to pull this up. Everyone, please like and share. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so. All right. Uh... I was born and raised in Chicago. I, for some reason, feel I could be, it could be law enforcement, says Carol Matthews. Well, it could be anybody, but at the end of the day, a killer already confessed to killing multiple people. So I'm going to take his word for it. He's already in prison for knowingly, and it's been proven that he killed many women in Indiana. He killed women in Texas. He killed uh, women in North Carolina. He killed women in different places, California. He said that he killed women in Illinois. So I'm going to go with what he said. That's what I'm going to go with. All right. I mean, he's done this other times. That's why he's in prison right now. Another thing is, um, with that all being said, we'll get into the specifics in a moment. Everyone, please like and share, subscribe to the channel. I mean, what you need to do in these types of cases is what y'all need to do is stop thinking with your emotions and think with your brain. Use logical, deductive reasoning, okay? That's what you do. Y'all are just blurting out stuff because that's what you think uh, because you don't know any better. At the end of the day, pay attention to the evidence and then draw a conclusion. How can you say what you think? You don't know what to think because you haven't seen all the evidence. So pay attention. Arthur Hilliard was charged today with killing 21-year-old Diamond Turner, a woman he dated. The victim's body was found by sanitation employees, partially naked and face down in a city of Chicago garbage can in the alley behind the defendant's apartment. Her family believed evidence found at the scene and witnesses pointed to Hilliard as her killer. It's been three long years for me, my sister, my whole family. 
So I'm glad he's in jail and he's going to get what he deserves. Diamond was among more than 50 women the CBS2 investigators previously reported on with similar cases, leading an expert to believe there was one or more serial killers loose in the city. However, unlike many of those cases, Diamond had no history of prostitution arrests. A police spokesman says that charges leading to Hilliard's arrest were held up more than a year because of delays in getting the results of DNA testing from the state. The spokesman says DNA gathered in the other unsolved cases we reported on will now be rechecked to see if Hilliard's DNA was found in any of them. Hilliard does have a criminal history. Most recently, he was convicted of concealing a homicidal death after a stabbing incident. He served 29 days in prison for that conviction. He was also previously charged in six misdemeanor assault or battery cases, but all of those were dropped. The sister of Andra Williams, the stabbing victim, believes her brother would be alive today if Hilliard had been arrested more quickly in Diamond's case. My brother was in a wheelchair, couldn't run, skip, jump, or hop, and he murdered my brother and left him in the alley in a shopping cart. The state's attorney's office says a third murder case involving Hilliard is also under investigation. A state police spokeswoman says their lab sent their latest evidence report in the Diamond Turner case to Chicago police almost a year ago. So, Brad and Erica, we have two police agencies blaming each other for the delays in that case. And an entire year passed while this test had been sitting there saying this guy did it. That's right. Yeah. And we're going to be looking at that. That issue. All right. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Okay, so now Hillard was arrested for that case. Okay, so now let's go to the videotape confession, all right, of uh, Mr. Vaughn, who, like I said, I believe is responsible for many of these killings. I absolutely do. And here's another thing, too. This is what I was going to tell you all. Uh, so, yes, he went after a man who was in a wheelchair, honey, low down and dirty. Um, at the end of the day, you know, what I was going to say, I almost forgot what I was going to say. At the end of the day, a lot of, of people who are killed by serial killers are often prostitutes, uh, people on drugs and things like that, because they're they're susceptible because they go get in the cars with these people. Most people aren't going to just walk off and get into the cars with strangers, right? Who does that? Especially with this day and age. So very often, these serial killers prey on people who are prostitutes, people who are on drugs. They promise them money and things like that. Let me tell you something. Lucius Boyd, one of the serial killers that I featured on my True Crime channel, he was doing things like that. Okay, This man had money, came from a well-to-do family, but he was a serial killer. OK, and the reason he got caught is because he ended up killing a woman that he actually knew because serial killers usually kill people that they don't know. OK, so there's no ties to them. There's no connection. That's why it's often difficult for law enforcement to find out who the killers are. That's why serial killers murder people for decades sometimes. And then they get caught later when they slip up. Sometimes they never get caught. No one has ever caught the Zodiac killer. Okay, that's unsolved. Uh, so I'm just saying they don't kill people that they know, like most people. Most people are murdered by people that they know. That's just a fact. Most people are murdered by people that they know. But in serial killer instances, they usually kill people that they don't know. They go out looking for soft targets. They go out prowling and looking for people that, you know, um, are by themselves, people that are not paying attention or people that are out walking the streets. OK, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, so this is just what they do. Uh, so anyway, let's go to the. Uh... Oh, and another thing, too, this is what I wanted to say. Also, this guy who I'm about to show you the video of the confession. Um, Darren Dion Vaughn was arrested in 2014. Now, it's interesting that when he was arrested in 2014, uh, the murders stopped. OK, uh, the same thing with Ted Bundy. So the murders decreased. 
I won't say they stopped, but they decreased. Uh, so with that all being said, when these things happen, that's how you can usually assess that it's likely a serial killer. You see, if the murders continue and all of these people are just turned up dead, okay, you could say, well, maybe it's different people or whatever. But a serial killer, when they're involved, for example, Ted Bundy, a prime example, and I talked about this in the interview yesterday. Ted Bundy was going to different states. He was going to Washington State, uh, you know, Seattle, uh, Utah, Colorado. He was going to all these different places, murdering women, sometimes more than one woman in a day. When he went to Lake Samish, he killed like two women that day. So with that all being said, when he would leave one place and go to another, the killings would stop in the place that he just left and they would resume in the place where he just went. Uh, so when Darren Dion Vaughn was arrested in 2014, that's what happened. Uh, so let's get into it. Now I'm about to show his confession. Likes up everyone, please like and share. And like I said, this this confession, we're able to view this confession due to the Freedom of Information Act. All right. Likes up everyone, please like and share. And I want you to pay attention to how matter of factly he talks about the murders. Like he's just telling us what he had for lunch. And, and what is fresh is in your mind from there that occurred? Like the, the one murder just previous to the Motel 6. I can't give you one before the Motel 6 because that would be out of state. The one before that was somebody I knew. She owed me money, didn't pay me. Well, that obviously that would be an easy one to start with if you know her. Well, I don't know her, nor like I know her from the streets. Okay. You don't know her name or nickname or anything uh, like that? If she Casper. Her nickname on the streets was Casper. She was a prostitute. How old would you say? I wouldn't know how old Casper is. I would say late 20s, early 30s. Well, I could be wrong because, you know, yeah. you're on drugs. And well, I'm, I'm just drugs. asking you to give. I mean... You also seem to be pretty intelligent, so I think you know what you're talking about. Okay, T is young. The girl is missing. I think they say she was late thirties, early forties. But I saw the post before. I really didn't pay no attention. I just knew the face. Now with Casper, what she look like? She's a Caucasian. She's Casper's about like two hundred. See, I'm not good with descriptions. She's like about this size. I don't know how, how you would describe a girl as this size. She's real big. Heavy set? Uh, yeah, yeah, heavy set. Some people say BBW. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's why I say she's anywhere from 28. It's a long blonde hair? Yes. I don't know if it's blonde or brown. I'm colorblind. So. All right. So late 20s to. Early 30s? She's 28 to 32. I'm not going to put her no older than okay. that. If she did, I wouldn't think so. Around what time would this have happened? I'm trying to think. See, I can't be sure what time I killed Casper because I did something else that same day. Where'd you kill her at? Oh, see, I'll tell you that dog go to the house. Uh, I killed her in Gary. All these in Gary I'm giving you. Okay, so Casper's a, a prostitute in Gary? Yes. Okay. She's a prostitute in Gary. She's another one. So Casper's body's inside of a, an abandoned house? Right now, yeah. Right now? Right now. On what street? I see her way on. Yeah, I'm not good at street. She's off the first street on the east side off of Broadway. I, I, I want to say Connecticut. They always get Massachusetts and Connecticut mixed up. So it's one, the, one, but it's block, the, east one block east of Broadway. In right. 100 block? I, I'm not sure. I just know, you, you ever walk and you know how to cut through all your trails? Mm -hmm. I know the trails is cut through. We cut through. I cut through the alley that go through the another abandoned house to get to this house. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sure. It's like a bunch of abandoned houses. Mm -hmm. Right. 
off of, off of Wood Main Street. That's all I'm saying. I was either Connecticut or Massachusetts. I don't come off the house off of Broadway. I come through a field when I go that yeah, way. Yeah, but it would just be north of it's 20, 20, 25th. It's in all this. This is in Glen Park. In Glen Park. So right. south would it be south of Ridge Road? Yeah, north? it's going to be south of Ridge. South of Ridge. What do you one is by? You know where Dora Miller is? Mm -hmm. I think it's Dora yeah. Miller Project. One is by Dora Miller. One is by, I want to say, one, two, three is by Georgia Street, Pavilion Park. Uh, one is by. Has the one by Dora Miller been located? No. They located a body, but it wasn't the right one. Well, it, it wasn't one of mine. Okay. Where's the one at in Dory Miller? Uh, I don't know their streets like that. You okay. know what I'm saying? Inside of a building? It's inside a house. Are mm -hmm. most of these inside of vacants? Mm -hmm. Yes, most of these are inside of vacants. How? And, and, and I believe you that, that you kind of want to put an mm -hmm. end to this. And right. That's why I say it'd be easier just to be like, bam, if there's a house. Would you you're gonna have to move some would, stuff. Would you be willing to have to because the police to, went in one house because they didn't move the right thing, they didn't find a body. You're kidding. Right. But would you be willing to to take us and I mean almost I mean I don't know what you call it, like a field trip and just show us I don't actually where point your, the bodies off, right. Your work products at. I don't really call it work. I call it my my mistakes. Your rages? Yeah, my rages. When stuff don't go right, I go looking for an out. I usually try to go to Illinois where I have my guns. I'm going to stop right there. Okay, so now pay attention. He said that he doesn't call it work. He calls it his rage. Because when things don't go right, he goes looking for an outlet. This is what he does. He's a whole sociopath, all right? Pay attention. Uh, so with that all being said, someone asked the question, uh, I believe it was TR, said, how is it unsolved, these cases, how are they unsolved if he confessed? Well, here's the thing, beloved. Obviously, you weren't listening. What I said was, he is in prison. He confessed to murders in Indiana, Gary, Indiana, okay? He confessed to murders in Gary, Indiana, he also said uh, that he killed people in um, Illinois, a lot of women in Illinois. He said he killed people in California, North Carolina. He only killed one in North Carolina because he wasn't there very long. That's what he said. Uh, Detroit, Chicago, and other places. So with that all being said, he confessed to murders, numerous murders. He is in prison because he was caught for one specific murder where he killed a young woman at a hotel. Now, usually um, he would kill these people, you know, uh, out in the streets, you know, have them somewhere outside. But he killed this woman in a hotel and he was quickly caught for that. So the cases aren't solved because they don't have, you know, uh, proof that he did these things. He said he did it and I believe him. I'm sure they do too. But he stopped talking. He was asking for the death penalty at first, so he was willing to talk. But then later on, he decided that he didn't want to die. He'd rather do life in prison. And so then afterwards, he didn't want to take them to locations of bodies. He didn't want to give them all the details because he doesn't want other states to try to prosecute him. And then he ended up going to the death, getting a death penalty sentence. OK, uh, so but like I said, uh, Mr. Hotel said Thomas said they believe what he says too. Yes, absolutely. Why would you not? He, he's already been proven that he's a killer. He literally got caught. So if he's saying these things, of course, I absolutely believe him as well. Okay? Uh, so with that all being said, it's also nefarious that someone would even go to these links, right? Uh, but hold on. Hold on just a moment. Let me see something real quick. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the confession. 
But then I'm going to go to the case that actually got him caught. Because I don't think I showed you all that yet. Uh, so let's get back into it. I'm going to share my screen. Everyone, please like and share. Uh, don't forget to like and share. Very important. Okay, here we go. You know what I'm saying? Sure. But if I don't have a way to get there or I'm getting help, like right now I'm watching my sister kids, so if I get upset, I can't just leave. I'm on schedule. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And that schedule compresses how to do things. What are the what things that cost you that cost you to go into a rage? Last year it's really kind of, I can't work. They want seven years. They want this. I went to get my ID. They want to get my ID. It's just so much. I'm just like I'm tired. Does it do anything for you? What? It releases. I want to say it releases pressure. Because really, I just, my brother tells me I'm crazy. I tell him all the time, I just want to walk in something and blow everything up. I, I, I guess what I'm asking, uh, how does the rage, how do you connect the rage with these people that. They're, they're they random. Know. They're random. All it does is take the wrong person to say something or it triggers something from my past. That's why I really can't give you Illinois because Illinois probably has a whole lot of. They have more than Indiana, let's say that. Yeah. They have way more than Indiana. Where, I were do, staying, where were you staying at over there? I don't have to stay anywhere. You were just. I just. I get on the train, I get on the bus, and I'll be like, I know I'm moving. I'm, I try to get far away from my family when I feel myself slipping. Yeah. Yes. Have you heard? Have you ever hurt anyone in your family? I can't answer that because that would give you another state. You see what I'm saying? But yes. Well, this is obviously going to be somewhat difficult because we're going to need some specific information and to be able to to verify these. And get you to where you're going. Well, I gave you this I, one. I don't think you're going to have any problem. Okay. Um, I mean, we. I, 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 I just want to say these the rest because these I call these my mistakes because they didn't really they did yeah. some that trigger my anger while I was already angered, but they really like Casper. Casper was my friend. I didn't mean to kill her. What what led up to that? I was already angry. Why don't we go when? Uh, when are we going to recover her body? I would do cash for the party because she was my friend. She was a good person. When do we do that? That's why I said we could take that ride. That way you know the rest I'm trying to get. Right. You realize what we're probably going to do is we're going to put you like in the belt that you're in now. That's fine. And we'll probably put you in some leg shackles. Because this is not something we do every day. Okay. You know well, what I mean? I don't think you could leg shackle because I'm not going to be able to get down where Casper is. You you don't think you'll be able to direct us to it? Oh, right. Oh. Well, I mean they're pretty decent. I mean they're not short leg shackles. I mean oh, you'll okay, be able to that's fine. And we like I said, like I said I'm, I'm from the south. Problem. I don't have to I'm go not, fast. I'm not gonna get any problems. I'm right. trying to get. It. Yeah, you you're, you're trying to put everything behind you. Well, that's not really behind you. These I'm giving you because they weren't supposed you want to, to be. It up. No, these weren't supposed to be people I killed. Mm -hmm. So these were people that have nothing to do with people hiring me to do something. For for the Motel Six, was, was that supposed to happen or no? She struck me. And she has struck. That's it. Uh, I don't like being hit. Actually, I'm really surprised. I, I know why I ain't go off when y'all just threw me down. Cause that's really one of my pet. I don't like people striking me or pushing mm -hmm. me. Did you hear me just saying hey? You just right. Yeah, you heard me, didn't you? Right. And see, I can't. I, I, I could tell you paid attention. See, my thing was well, like my niece, my niece up there. The kids are right. That's why I try to get far away. Cause I wasn't even supposed to come. I don't even know what made me mad. I don't know what made me mad. Somebody didn't pay me. I did the work for me. They didn't pay me. Cause they figured I'm selling. I can't do nothing about it. I didn't have mm -hmm. no contract. When when did that happen? <coughs> it happened Friday morning. I went and fixed some drywall for a guy. Where at? I don't I don't know. It just I'll be on tag and Facebook and they, they say come and do somebody will pick me up I go
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hate when I do that. Okay. So with that all being said, someone asked, do they need more evidence? Uh, yes, they do need more evidence because that's not, you know, he was actually um, arrested for killing a 19 year old woman by the name of Africa Hardy. He murdered her at a motel six. That's why he was in custody. Now he started talking about these other crimes and giving information. Well, they can't just, they can't just go by his word. They need details. You know, they need him to be specific, you know, cause some people will lie and say that they did things that they didn't do just for clout or just foolishness or just, you know, cause they have mental issues or whatever. Uh, so uh, this is what they have to do. Okay. Uh, they have to continue to ask questions and get him to be specific and all of that. All right. So that's basically what it is. Now, like I said, he killed this young woman and that's what got him caught. Otherwise, he may have likely gotten away with this for more decades. I mean, he was killing people in different places, going from state to state. It's very hard to track someone who's doing that. But also, I know you all heard him say that there's much more in Illinois. There's many more. He said that. OK, and here's another thing. He also said uh, that he was uh, sometimes he would catch the train uh, to go out and find people to kill. Well, uh, coincidentally, many of these women who were killed in, in Chicago, they were killed on the train route. OK, uh, so very likely I believe him too, beloved. So very likely he did, you know, exactly what he's saying he did. Now, QW said he's mental. No, he's not mental. He's absolutely not mental. I don't think he is. He seems fully cognizant of what he's saying and doing. And because someone is a serial killer doesn't make them mental, okay? These people are not often crazy. So let's not give them that out. People who are serial killers are usually methodical, you know, organized, planned, calculated psychopaths or sociopaths. And being a psychopath or a sociopath is not mental illness. It is a character flaw. That's what it is. It's a character flaw. He's not crazy. He knows exactly what he's doing. All right? People who are insane usually don't have the presence of mind to try to cover up their crimes, especially not for a period of decades. Uh, people who are crazy, who are clinically insane, may not even know that they did anything wrong. They may be delusional, have halluc uh, hallucinations and things like that. Those people are called psychotics. A psychotic person is crazy. A psychopath is not. Neither is a sociopath. All right. Uh, so you see how cavalierly he was talking about the details and saying what he did. Like he was just talking a regular conversation. Someone said it sounded like a, a job interview. Yes, that's how casual it was that he was talking. But like Thomas Hargrove said yesterday during our interview uh, that these people, serial killers, they often disassociate themselves. And that's what they do. They don't view the victims as human beings. They view them as objects. And so he said also that he took out his frustrations on these people that he was killing. Uh, sometimes he said he would be already mad about something. Now, remember the woman that he said he killed that was his friend, Casey, Cassie, whatever her name was. He said that he didn't mean to kill her, but she struck him or she he was already mad. And so he took that opportunity to kill her. Exactly. Louise says no empathy, no conscience. Absolutely. That's what they don't have. Okay, so now let's talk about the young woman who he murdered, Africa Hardy, uh, who was 19 years old. Uh, this is why he got caught in Gary, Indiana. Darren Dion Vaughn was no stranger to police. Even before police caught up with him this weekend, uh, mind you, this is from 2014 when he was actually arrested, uh, Vaughn's record was well established. He had gone to jail at least twice before on felony convictions. But if authorities are not, or if authorities are to be believed, his time behind bars didn't prove much of a deterrent. That didn't stop him from being a whole criminal and a killer. Authorities went after 43-year-old Vaughn this weekend in connection with the death of 19-year-old Africa Hardy at a Motel 6 in Hammond, Indiana. Not only did he confess to that killing, uh, but the police said that Vaughn also admitted to six other women, uh, other women's deaths in Indiana. A police said he led them to the women's bodies 
in abandoned structures in Gary, Indiana. Now, I need you to pay attention to this because he killed these women. That's seven women that he killed in Indiana. That's why he's in prison right now for life. He killed seven women. These women were black. These women were strangled. These women were found in abandoned buildings, like some of the women in Chicago. All right. And so they were found in abandoned structures. And so goes on to say, it disgusts me because it's seven bodies. This is what Ronnie Williams, a resident of Gary, Indiana, uh, of the neighborhood, this is where many of the victims or some of the victims were found. That's what he said. He was disgusted. Now, Vaughn had an initial court appearance uh, related to Hardy's killing, but it was held, but was held in contempt of court when he refused to answer the judge's questions. Vaughn was re represented by a state appointed public defender by the name of Matthew Feet. Now, there's much more that's not known publicly about Vaughn. In fact, that there's uh, there's very little that's known. Like, what is his background? What did he do for a living? Um, if it was proven he killed these seven women, would he do such? Why would he do such a thing? Well, because he's a whole serial killer. So they go and say what is known is that Vaughn was born in Indiana, but didn't stay there his whole life. Uh, records, for instance, show that he was arrested on unspecified charges while living in Cherry Point, North Carolina in 1993. Now, it was in the 90s that Edward Matlock first got to know Van or Vaughn. Vaughn had married Matlock's, Matlock's mother, who was about 30 years older than Vaughn. Matlock said he wasn't comfortable or happy with his mother's marriage, which lasted 16 years. Uh, part of it had to do with the age difference between the couple. Uh, then there were Matlock's observations that Vaughn talked to himself or sometimes seemed lost in thought. In addition to stories he heard about Vaughn spending time in a rough part of Austin, Texas, where the pair had moved. He said, the guy's a nutcase. Uh, he is, and I'd watch him. That's what Matlock told CNN's Ashley Banfield. I'd never allow him near my kids or in my house because he just freaked me out. And that's likely because the person that's saying all of this, he likely felt his energy, which is clearly nefarious. All right? Clearly nefarious. Uh, so Matlock said things went downhill for Vaughn after he got fired from a temp agency, adding that he had trouble finding good work after that, likely because he was a felon and he had other, you know, cases or whatever. Uh, eventually, Vaughn and Matlock's mother moved from Austin to uh, Gary, Indiana, where Matlock said he found him living in poverty. Gary said Gary was where Vaughn had his first major brush with the law. Uh, so in April of 2004, with a woman who wasn't Matlock's mother, uh, who was described as Vaughn's girlfriend, uh, that's when he first got into some trouble. Now, according to a police affidavit tied to that incident, Vaughn threatened to burn down or blow up the home of a man whom he believed was sheltering his girlfriend. Then in front of the police, he grabbed his girlfriend right in front of the police, mind you, and told the police to back up or he would burn himself and his girlfriend, according to the affidavit. Now, with his left arm around the woman's neck and his right hand holding a gasoline can and a lighter, Vaughn refused her request for freedom, right up until police grabbed him and arrested him. Now, the thing is, the police didn't shoot and kill him. Somebody who clearly deserved it, as far as I'm concerned. Now, Vaughn was charged with a Class D felony and spent 90 days behind bars after his conviction. At some point after his release, Vaughn went back to Austin. That's where in December of 2007, he was arrested again, this time for aggravated sexual assault. Keep in mind, the murders in Chicago had sexual components. The women were either stripped naked, partially disrobed, or their clothes had been ripped. All right. Now, according to the affidavit out of Travis County, a 25-year-old woman responded to a service call from her, her employer, met Vaughn, and the two went to an apartment. After they got inside, Vaughn asked her if she was a police officer, and she told him that she was not. That's when he attacked her. Out of the blue, just attacked the woman. Uh, the court document details how Vaughn choked, repeatedly struck, and great the woman. Now, without the G, uh, a grand jury indicted him in July of 2008. 
He pleaded guilty and was convicted in September of 2009 and sentenced to five years in prison. Now, that led to accounting for time served. Uh, his release was on July the 15th of 2013, according to Texas Department of Criminal Justice spokesperson Jason Clark. So while he was in prison for those five years, uh, the murders decreased. Pay attention. Now, again, Vaughn didn't stay put for long after he got out of jail. He registered as a sex offender in prison. I then told officials that there uh, told the officials there that he would move back to Gary, Indiana. Texas authorities alerted their colleagues in Lake City, Indiana, uh, that Vaughn was to be considered low risk, a, a low risk sex offender, uh, which is based on experts assessment of the likelihood that a person will commit another sexual offense. So he, they thought he was low level. Little did they know he's a whole serial killer. Now, in the 15 months since Vaughn left Texas, he killed seven women with six of their bodies in some of the uh, in some of the estimated 10,000 abandoned structures in Gary. There may have been more victims, according to police. After Hardy was found strangled in a Motel 6 bathtub, authorities used cellular phone records to track down Vaughn on Saturday, along with the blue Jeep that he was driving. Police said Vaughn also had Hardy, Hardy's pink phone and other potentially key pieces of evidence. Uh, police said Vaughn confessed, telling them that he messed up and expressing surprise that he finally uh, that he'd been found so quickly. He didn't say he was sorry or any of that. He was just shocked that he got caught so fast. Uh, Hammond Police Chief John Doughty gave this information and said, they said a short time later, he led authorities to six other victims. So he led them to the bodies. So that's how they know he did those seven. Police said Vaughn confessed, telling them that he messed up. And uh, so... Authorities have not detailed what relationship, if any, Vaughn had with any of the victims. Uh, in fact, police have only identified four of those killed at the, at the moment of this article. Uh, so as for Doty or Doty, uh, they said, I don't have a specific reason that I don't have a specific reason that he does this. Uh, so anyway, let me go to the footage. Likes up, everyone, please like and share. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Be sure to click the notification bell and click the word all. Hold on, I'm having issues loading this video. Let's see if it's going to play now. Okay, so that's not going to play for whatever reason. Hold on. Let me find another one. Let me find another one. Here we go. Let me make sure this is going to play first. They actually call him the Gary Strangler. Also, FYI. Okay, so I'm waiting for this to load. All the police can do is arrest them. Problem is the DA's judges. Hold on. Uh, and paroles and pardons. QW says, so he was raping and robbing these women to get from one point to another because of the trains weren't free. No, he wasn't robbing them, beloved. He wasn't robbing them. That's not what he was doing. Yes, he was graping them. That's what many serial killers do. Ted Bundy was doing the same thing. Um, John Wayne Gacy, same thing. Jeffrey Dahmer, same thing. There's usually a sexual component to serial killings because serial killers get gratified from having power and control over other people in many cases. Okay, so that's likely why he was doing that. Also, they're usually perverts and freaks and have hedonistic tendencies. Now, with that all being said, he was not robbing them. This wasn't about money or cash. He sat there and said that it was because he would be angry or he'd be going through stuff and he'd take it out on his victims. He'd go looking for victims. And that's what that was all about. And he did say also, if you were listening, that some of them were prostitutes and on drugs. That's what he said. 
And the reason he would pick those victims, as I told you before, is because those are easy targets. Those are the people most likely to get in a car with somebody like him. Yes, Mr. Hotel said, yes, he did say that. Exactly. And so, because I saw someone said that the media says that these women were prostitutes and stuff. Well, that's because they were. Some of them were prostitutes, not all of them, but some of them were prostitutes, uh, sex workers, whatever you want to call them. And some of them were absolutely on drugs. Uh, like the woman that I showed you the video of, the woman who was chained up in that uh, abandoned house in Chicago and the man took her in there and had her for days or whatever. Um, I'm sorry, but she did look like she was, you know, for the streets. Uh, so I'm just saying. And not just victim shame, but I'm just saying that's the type of people they target. Gary Ridge, uh, what do they what do they call him? Gary Ridgeway, the Green River Killer. He was targeting women who were prostitutes as well. That's just what most of them do because many people, society in general, doesn't care about prostitutes, drug addicts, homeless people. They don't really care about these people. Doesn't matter what race you are. If they if they're homeless, if you're on drugs, you're living on the streets. You're out here being a, a, a sex worker. Who really cares about these people? Law enforcement absolutely does not. Now, disproportionately, we know they don't care about you if you're black, right? Uh, so that's just what it is. And these people who are the killers, they know these things. So they're not going to go get someone from an Ivy League college or someone who's working at a good job. No, they're going to go out there and target people who they think no one cares anything about. All right? That's just what they do. Nine times out of 10. Okay. Like up, everyone, please like and share. Now, hopefully this is going to play. Police linked to suspected serial killer Darren. Hold on. I don't know what happens. Night. Time for dinner. Not now. Bedtime, Layla. Not now. Come on, Layla. Not now. Time to get going, Layla. Not now. Hey, are you coming to happy hour? Not now. Now. When you're ready, Hiscox is there for you. Hiscox, protecting business dreams since 1901. Seven women. That's how many victims police linked to suspected serial killer Darren Van. And tonight, authorities in northwest Indiana, Illinois, and as far away as Texas now say they're going through cold cases because there may be more victims. We have two live reports. Eyewitness News reporter Ben Bradley leads our coverage. Ben. Ron Cathy, if this confessed serial killer is to believe, his murderous ways go back nearly 20 years. Police so far have only been able to connect him to seven deaths, all relatively recent, all here in northwest Indiana. Tonight, detectives search a home where suspected serial killer Darren Van frequently stayed. Their investigation aided by Van's detailed confession. He was very specific on the locations and very specific about what transpired at each, at each location. So far, police have found six women dumped inside five abandoned homes in Gary. Sources say some had been there for months, but all appear to have been killed elsewhere. The final victim, 19-year-old Africa Hardy, met her fate after answering a sex ad on Backpage.com, where Van allegedly went by the moniker Big Boy Appetite. A person who helped her arrange the tryst grew concerned when she couldn't reach Hardy. She went to the motel and found her dead in the bathtub, the water still running. Investigators think Van strangled Hardy with an extension cord. Police caught up to him in Gary the next day. Mr. Van told him and police officers at the scene that he had messed up by not committing by committing the crime in Hammond and was surprised at how quickly he was located. He was so protective of everybody, you know, that would come around or if we go visit anybody. No, he was a real friendly person. While Van's ex-wife may not have noticed trouble, police in Austin, Texas did. Van was convicted of a 2007 sexual assault in which he also strangled a woman. An affidavit obtained by the I-Team describes another incident 10 years ago in Gary in which Van poured gas on his then-girlfriend during a standoff with police. I'll light both of us up and kill us both, Van threatened. Tonight, as police search more abandoned homes, Van's neighbors are puzzled.
Last couple of weeks we've been talking, and he just said that he'd been having a good time, you know, partying. Gary's mayor calls the killings devastating to her community, even as Van's own words help find women few were looking for. It's been kind of um, harrowing, gory, but um, he has been um, accurate. Police tell me Darren Van has given them a motive or at least an explanation of why he allegedly killed these women, but they're not ready to publicly share it just yet. Live in Gary, Ben Bradley, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. Ron? Thanks, Ben. That's also egregious. So four of the women that he killed in Gary, Indiana, were identified. Three of them were Jane Doe's. All right. And as you can see, uh, that woman. Um, hold on. Hold on, beloveds. Okay. I was trying to block that troll site where somebody's putting adult dating site in here or whatever. I hope I didn't block the wrong person. Okay, yeah, I think I got them. Okay, so anyway, with that all being said, um, someone was asking in the chat, I can't remember which of you asked the question, but you said, how was he you know, going back and forth from state to state, riding trains? Well, he wasn't always riding trains, he was driving. Um, he said that when he was in Chicago, when he was in Chicago, I do believe he was catching the train. In some instances, he was catching trains. Uh, but usually he was saying that he wanted to, you know, be far away from his family uh, so that none of this stuff would be connected to him. So he was going out of town. That's what he was doing. And so, like I said, um, <laughs> Otis said adult wig site. Are you serious? <laughs> uh, so anyway, with that all being said, um, his wife, also has something to say. So I'm going to go to that footage of what his, um, I'm sure she's his ex-wife now. Uh, thank you, beloved. <laughs> thank you, uh, Shadow Priest. Okay, so now let's go to what the wife had to say. It's exactly like The Bachelorette, except there are no bachelorettes and all the men are gay. Other than that, you'd never know the difference. Bros, rated R, only in theaters September 30th. Catch Billy and Luke on Men Tell All. Our ABC 7 I team broke, broke the news this morning that Darren Van was in custody and that he was a sex offender from Texas. Tonight, we have new details on the man who could become Indiana's most prolific serial killer. Eyewitness News investigative reporter Chuck Gowdy joining us tonight with what the I team has learned. Chuck. Kathy Allen, so far, Darren Van is charged with just one murder, but has told police he killed six others, and they have the bodies, some of them found concealed in abandoned homes, had been there for months. Tonight, what Van has told police about just the one case, the most recent killing, sounds like his M.O. He hires a prostitute, has rough sex that turns violent, and then strangulation. He was quiet. I mean, he was a pretty good neighbor, you know. Never this man was Darren Van's neighbor, says he and the 43-year-old Van walked neighborhood watch together. The last couple of weeks we've been talking, and he just said that he'd been having a good time, you know, partying. For Van, the party ended last weekend. Okay, so I stopped that one because we already saw that one. That was a different article with the same video. And so with that all being said, listen, this man is a whole psychopath. And he said that he was hiring these women for sex. And we know that's what he did with the Africa Hardy because she answered a sex ad. Her friend or someone dropped her off when she didn't return her call. They got suspicious and went back to the spot where they had dropped her off. And that's how he was caught. All right. Uh, warrior status said no soul. Absolutely. These people have no empathy, sympathy, remorse, or any of those things. They only feel those type of emotions for themselves. That's literally what it is. Okay. Um, Queen, do you listen to the Serial Killer podcast? Uh, I very often don't listen to podcasts. I don't have much time. I do know that there are some. Uh, but so anyway, with that all being said, listen, this man is likely to blame for many of these black women whose cases are unsolved. OK, he led them to the bodies of the women in Indiana that he killed. He also admitted that he killed women in Illinois. He said many more. Now, I want you to pay attention because he killed seven in Gary, Indiana, possibly more. But he admitted to at least seven in Gary, Indiana. 
But he also said in his tape confession that he killed many more than the seven in Illinois. Now, I don't think he killed all of them, but I do believe that he killed many of them. There could have been a copycat killer that was doing the same thing, or they could have been several serial, serial killers. Now, Thomas Hargrove said that he believed there was at least three, one white one and two black ones is what he said. Um, if you didn't watch the interview, then I suggest you do. You'll get more insight. Uh, so Emperor Rex says guilty. All right. Uh, told you he was. Oh, this, this is no time for jokes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hotel. <laughs> Thank you, beloved. Thank you. So this is just all so sad. And the, and the thing is, we don't hear these people's stories very often. We don't hear their stories. And like they said themselves, it's very often not on the lamestream media. So that's why I report on these things to shed light on them. And that's why it's good that you have um, the Murder Accountability Project who looks into these things, gathers information, and then gives it to the police. Uh, to, to help them because Thomas Hargrove and his colleagues, they're not police officers, okay? They're doing this because that's what they want to do. It's a nonprofit organization. So they're doing this. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, if no one says anything about this, then none of these cases will ever get solved. No one will ever, would ever, you know, bring any attention to it. I mean, this has been going on for decades and we're just recently hearing about it pay attention. Now, I'm sure people in Chicago heard about it, but I'm just saying for the rest of the world, like I literally just heard about this in May when I found the story about that woman who was chained up in that abandoned house. Uh, so I'm from Chicago. I haven't heard of most of them, says Twin Tichi. That's what I'm saying. Like these stories get little to no coverage. So you have to shine a light on these things. If no one tells, if you know, if no one tells our stories, they won't get told. That's all I'm saying. So with that all being said, also, um, before I close out, let's do uh, the missing, the missing women, right? The missing women and young girls. So let me go to that footage. Um, or not the footage, but let me go to those stories. It's on my Twitter. And those of you who don't follow me on Twitter, please do. I post all of my links to videos there. And I also post other videos for your information, um, like missing women and all of that. All right, so let me pull that up real quick. Everyone, please like and share. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you in advance, beloveds. And if you have any missing uh, missing people cases that you would like for me to talk about, please feel free to send it to my email. Also, any uh, Black-owned businesses that you need me to highlight. All right, whether it be yours or someone else's. So... Let me uh, pull this up. Likes up, everyone. Please like and share. Okay, so as you can see, hope you all can see that. Okay, this is Janiah Walker, okay? Janiah Walker is missing uh, since June the 23rd of 2022. She's 15 years old uh, from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, light complexion, five foot three, weighs approximately 110 pounds. Hair color is black, shoulder length, and brown eyes. And so, said she was last seen about 2.30 p.m. June the 23rd near the intersection of East Reservoir Avenue and North Buff, uh, I think it's Buffin Street. Uh, Janiah's mother said her daughter suffers from depression and PTSD and is shy and likely in a vulnerable state circumstances of her disappearance uh, in a recent interview her mother said that she remains frustrated that milwaukee police have not classified her daughter as a critical missing uh person the designation means police release information to the news media and the case is investigated by the department's sensitive crimes division 
Despite Janiah being a missing child, uh, police said her case did not meet the criteria for critical missing status. Isn't that something? Now, you already know that's because she's black. I'm sorry. If that was not a black child, uh, she would absolutely be listed as something uh, as in critical. Okay. And especially because she suffers from depression. All of that. She may have issues. Destiny Wallet, missing since August the 19th of 2022, age 17 from Austin, Texas. Okay. Uh, medium complexion, five feet, 420 pounds, black hair, uh, long hair with brown eyes. Destiny was last seen at around 5.45 a.m. at the Spring Hill Suites by Marriott on Stone Lake Boulevard in North Austin. The family told police that Destiny told her dad that she was going to work out, but actually left the hotel with her fishing pole. Uh, she was last seen wearing a black hoodie, gray sweatpants, a black drawstring bag, and a mini, a mini teal backpack purse. Circumstances of her disappearance. Uh, the family told police that her last ping was off of the Rutland Drive. Uh, off of Rutland Drive between 3.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. Although phone tracking shows movement through downtown, uh, downtown Austin before heading back to North Austin. So those are the missing people um, that I'm highlighting today. So this is also said, maybe sex trafficking or organ harvesting, says Terry Hinn. Absolutely. That very likely could be the case. I absolutely would not be surprised i absolutely would not be surprised okay so now with that all being said um you see the grief and agony that that father was in and his daughter's been you know dead for years now she was the first one that i talked about on the powerpoint angela ford went to go pick up her children's report cards and never returned that is also sad now let me see if i can pull up the uh The information with the names of the victims. Everyone, please like and share. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you in advance. Hold on. It's going to take me a second to find this. I think this, <clears throat> excuse me, I think this might be it. No, that's not it. Okay, um, I can't remember where I saved it. I can't remember where I saved it. Let me see if this is it. Nope. Hold on, bear with me, beloveds. I have a lot of receipts. Hold on, let me check one more place. Maybe this is it. Okay, so nevertheless, I did want to show you all the names of all of the victims. Uh, like I said, there's 51. I wanted you all to see that. Um, let's see the list of their names. But alas, I can't remember where I saved it. Yeah, this is not it. Okay, so anyway, I'm going to go ahead and conclude this broadcast. I'm going to go ahead and conclude this broadcast. Um, but this just goes to show that women specifically need to be careful. No matter where you're going, what time of day or night, especially at night, you need to be careful. You should have something to protect yourselves. And you should try not to be out alone if you can help it at the end of the day. 
because you never know. You know, there's a lot of people coming up missing, some of them never to be seen or heard from again. There's people, women turn it up dead, as we can clearly see. And uh, this could be the work of one or more serial killers. Who knows? At this point, we don't have any um, clear evidence or whatever, other than the fact that Va Vaughn admitted to killing women in numerous states. And so anyway, with that all being said, oh, you're welcome, Terry, beloved. Uh, Kenyatta, thank you. Kenyatta said, very informative. Okay, so let me just see something real quick. Y'all know I hate when I can't find my receipts. Let me see if this is it real quick. Um, hold on. I think this is it right here. So on a TED Talk interview that Thomas Hargrove delivered, he spotlighted uh, work on behalf of the murdered women, Scott. Uh, this guy named Scott, he spotlighted his work. I think Scott is the person who did the, uh, hold on, let me make sure, hold on. Hold on, beloveds. This is a receipt that I forgot. Okay, so they say a state senator, Patricia Van Pelt, um, whose district includes the West Side, hosted a public hearing in which she railed against a backlog of 13,000 DNA samples from murder cases statewide uh, that had yet to be tested. Now, U.S. Congressman Bobby Rush assembled a forum in his district on the South Side, adding to the adding to the pressure on the police to review the cold cases. Congressman Rush declared, "We all must continue to think that there is a possible serial killer or killers that's living amongst us." Beverly Reed Scott didn't just see the 51 murdered women whose faces flashed on the CBS broadcast; she actually felt their energy. Uh, enter and fill her stomach. She said, it's like I knew them and could feel them. I knew that I had to do something because I wanted to be, or because they wanted to be acknowledged. Uh, so they say, Scott, who calls herself um, an ego, an echo, a Greek spirit muse, is 60 years old uh, and she's married and living in Olympia Fields. Now, she remembered being similarly possessed by a portent back in 1997 when she was on public aid, a single mother of five working in a community development nonprofit on the South Side. Uh, so I wondered if this woman's a medium because she said she felt there's energy into her. And then she also talked about being possessed back in 1997. Uh, so anyway, uh, Scott couldn't merely suck her teeth and complain to friends reporting rituals of empty out outrage as uh, she organized a rally. Uh, so, okay, so she's the person who got a rally together, okay, and they started raising awareness and consciousness about the women that were being killed. Uh, they said Scott registered as a charity and opened a bank account. Uh, the funds swelled to more than $300,000. Uh, then girl X's mother, which is one of the victims who... Um, one of the victims who was killed, uh, her mother sued, winning a summary judgment since Scott had used $40,000 of the donations for expenses and a salary for herself. Uh, so she obviously felt like the money the money was spent, you know, incorrectly. Uh, she said that that could have been 
me. I've been in situations, I've been almost murdered, choked on the railroads uh, and the tracks and, and played dead to survive. That's what Scott said about herself. She said she actually had been a victim of something like that. Beverly Reed Scott is her name. Uh, so anyway, with that all being said, I'm going to skip on down. So they say in a TED Talk, Thomas Hargrove delivered, he spotlighted Scott's work on behalf of the murdered women. Uh, Scott believed that like her, most most anyone could see themselves in Rio Holly, Hollyfield, and that's one of the victims, uh, and the other women un, identified in the algorithm. She felt she could see herself. Uh, they just needed to find the connection and then put some love there, but some inner, put some energy into making things better. Do something, she urged. Stop thinking you have to solve the case to matter. If you, got, if you have money, send money to one of the organizations that do that kind of work, she said. Oh, she says, don't send me nothing. Okay, so they have the victims' names here, which I'm going to pull up on the screen because that's what I was actually looking for. Okay, <laughs> Kenya said no word from Lightfoot yet. Yeah, I haven't heard anything from her on this issue. Not saying that she hasn't said anything, but I hadn't heard anything. Uh, so there are the names of the women right there. Let me see if I can uh, enlarge that so you all can see it. And then I'm going to get out of here because it's been quite a lengthy broadcast hold on where did they go okay here we go right here okay angela mariana ford charlotte w day winifred shines brenda cowart elaine bonetta sadia banks bessie scott Gwendolyn williams joy or jody grissom lorraine harris Delly Jones, Celeste Jackson, Nancy Walker, Tarika Jones, Linda Green, Rosinda Barossia, uh, Latanya Keeler, Latricia Hall, Lucy Setts, aka Mary Thomas, Ethel Emerson, Michelle Davenport, Tamala Edwards, uh, Michaela Michaela Va, uh, Va Williams, Precious Smith, Denise V. Torres. Wanda Hall, Yvette Mason, Shaniqua Williams, Margaret E. Gomez, Antoinette P. Simmons, uh, Kelly Sarf, Veronica Frazier, Mary Ann Swatstowski, uh, Teresa Bunn, Hazel Marion Lewis, Geneve, Genevieve Mellis, Charlene Miller, Latoya Banks, Shannon Williams, Vanessa Rajovic, Rajovic, uh, LaFonda Sue Wilson, Quanda L. Grider. Angela Prophet, Pamela Wilson, Velma Howard, Diamond Turner, Catherine Saffer, Satterfield, uh, De Buchanan, Valerie Marie Jackson, Laura Dawn Harbin, Nicole and Nell Ridge, Rio Renee Holyfield. Those are the names of the 51 people, 51 women that were killed. And you know, um, most of those women were black uh the reason i was looking for the uh names on the site is because it had their not only their names but it had their races you know most of them were black there was probably like four of them who were white and uh maybe a couple of them were hispanic but disproportionately they were black but some of them were white and some of them were hispanic uh, so with that all being said um they were all killed in the same manner, okay? And, and and as I also said, I believe that it is the work of more than one serial killer. That's just what I believe um, at the end of the day. Serial killers usually kill people who look like them, not all the time, but most of the time. Uh, so Thomas Hargrove says that he thinks that there is one white serial killer and two black ones. And that likely could be the case. And I believe that one of the black ones is absolutely Darren Dion Vaughn. All right. He admitted to murdering those seven women in Indiana. He led the police to the bodies. He boasted of killing women in Illinois much more than he killed in Indiana. He also said that he killed one person in North Carolina, only one because he was there only briefly, he said. He also said that he killed women in Texas. That's because he and his wife had moved to Texas. He said he killed women in Minnesota and Detroit. He is a whole serial killer. And I do believe that he is responsible for most of those women. That's just what I think. 
I absolutely think so. Uh, so with that all being said, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Please make sure you like and share uh, this video. It's very important that we share this type of information. If we don't cover our stories, who will? Make sure you like and share. Subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the commentary. All right. Um, each one, teach one. That's how we grow and thrive. Do something productive, constructive, but never destructive. And always remember to keep the most high first in your lives, beloved. And until next time, I will talk to you all again soon. Peace.